I've definitely seen, like when I look at, for example, there's a test that I've done a few times by Glycanage, which looks at glycans and the inflammation. And mine is super low, always puts me in my 20s. It kind of changes a little bit. But I, I'm almost certain when I look at the metrics, it's the fact that I, and I look at the indices that come up, it's the fact that I regularly exercise and I manage my stress and I eat loads of plants, like you suggest, right, full of antioxidants. And those are the indices that regularly come back. It's not because I'm doing any kind of crazy biohacking or supplements or anything like that. In fact, I know when I interviewed the founder of that company, she said, actually, the biohackers age the fastest is what they see. Um, oh, on this cool. Test. That's good to know. <laughs> that, that's what yeah. they were seeing. Uh, and interestingly, oh. actually, do you know what was coming up? And it's an area of research that they're looking at at the moment is getting too lean. So kind of going the other way seems to be, and it's very early, so they don't yet have the research, but it seems to, and looking at like biobank data and other data they have, that seems to age you. And definitely when I kind of got a bit leaner just through getting just more and more into exercise, more for my mental health, actually the indices changed slightly. So super interesting. Obviously I had the hormones changing as well. Yeah, it, it makes sense though, because if you're looking at some of the muscle indices in in sarcopenia and all the inflammatory processes that happen that's kind of like getting like yes you're having poor quality muscle but if you're thinking about someone who's getting too lean it's like not only are they losing the body fat but they're also losing the muscle and if they don't have enough to support everything that muscle is going to keep being um used for the amino acids instead of being built so it's a really interesting line we also see from the literature in eating disorders and anorexia the high inflammatory um responses and the high crp and everything that happens in people who are really severely underweight or or actually in a, a lean factor that puts them in a kind of a questionable um, bracket for body comp. And I guess as well, I want to come back to protein in a moment because your knees are going to be higher as well, right? If you're working a lot, it's not just physical demands, it's the brain demands that are needed in terms of those amino acids. Um, I want to come back to how to fuel in a second because I think if we can break it down, because this is where people get confused. If we take exercise, you mentioned there that there's different categories of women. There are women who've been exercising exercising their whole life. So by the time they get to perimenopause, they've already got a long exercise history. And then there are some women who are realizing, oh, yeah, I should have prioritized this and I haven't. And there's going to be different rules, if you like, or uh, platforms to start from for those two categories of women. So if we take, um, you mentioned around zone two, if we take the woman who is fairly untrained, right, she's done classes and things, and then she's gone through periods where she hasn't exercised, and then she's got back into it, but she's now seeing social media, seeing your content, and realizing I need to do something about this to support myself, where should she begin? Yeah, it's the same as when we're looking at anybody who starts any kind of training pretty much at any age. It's like, you can't just throw someone in the deep end of the high intensity work, either resistance training or the cardiovascular. You have to really have a pre-fitness fitness, meaning that you have to be able to have the robustness of the motor patterns. You have to have the robustness of the ligaments, the tendons, the metabolic responses within the muscle in order to have a full adaptation to be fit enough to then add heavier load and higher intensity. So if we're looking at someone who used to be active and now all of a sudden they've had a 10 or 15 year break and they've been intermittent kind of, yeah, I'll get on this walking or running bandwagon and then I'll pull it back. You want to just start with consistency. And we can start that consistency of, okay, let's go for a low intensity walk or swim a few times a week. And then let's add some body weight strength training stuff. And we get into the consistency of those habits. And then we can start manipulating those days with different intensities and loading as the body has adapted and gotten fitter and can be more stress resilient to added load and intensity. That makes sense. Because I see this a lot with women who, for example, have really taken their car their careers have taken off and they've added in kids. And in their like late 20s, early 30s, before they had them, they were doing things like triathlons, they were super fit. And actually, when I look at their data, what you see is they still maintained a low resting heart rate, their HRV still looks pretty good, because they had that aerobic base. But now they're starting to get that weight gain, they don't have the same energy. And they're kind of short on time, if you like. So how can they, some, some things like zone two, for example, you're not really going to get loads of benefits of zone two training for 10 minutes, right? You have to do a bit longer. So if they're coming into this, is that a case of almost using 
that exercise session as a down regulation of their nervous system at the same time. So like they're going out for a long walk at weekend when they have time or how would they begin to integrate this if they're really busy? Because the benefits with HIT is it's super fast, right? You can get it done. And when we start looking at um, like the busy, really highly stressed individual, which I think we've both been part of or are part of that right now, and you're trying to find pockets of time, this is where when we're looking at the consistency, it's like, okay, if we're looking at Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, Saturday are the days that we've mapped out 20 to 30 minutes of work for us. Maybe the first three weeks when we're trying to build that consistency, we're working on mobile mobilization. So we're looking at using voodoo floss and resistance bands to increase our range of motion so that we can start to move better. If we're doing that, we are adding some resistance and load, but we're also stimulating that parasympathetic because we're able to get in and manipulate the nervous system in a way that's creating us not to be in this hunched like stress state, but to open up all of our posture and all of our joints. So we're spending consistency that way. Then we can also look, okay, after a mobilization session, maybe I'm going to add some body weight pushups because that's going to bring the heart rate up. It's also going to start working on building muscle and strength. So we just start tapping into small bits of energy systems and seeing what is needed at that time. Once we have that three or four weeks of consistency in those days, then we can go, okay, well now in that 20 minute session you have on a Monday, we're going to warm up for five minutes with some mobilization. We're going to throw in some um, explosive kettlebell swings as our sprint interval training. And then we're going to finish with some body weight squats and push-ups because we want to really start getting more into that resistance training. So it is a stepwise increase, but I wouldn't have her go for a 20 minute walk at zone two, because that's not going to do anything. That makes sense. And I guess make the most of that time. When we look at somebody who has been training for quite some time, right? They're really into their training uh, and they want to optimize for longevity and hit all the different pillars. So they want to make sure that they're looking after their bone density. They want to have their power, their speed. They also want to have strength in addition to muscle mass and insulin sensitivity. Um, they want to improve all of those markers. How would they look at across a year, how might they structure that training plan? Uh, gosh, that's a hard one when you're looking across a year. If they're parents, I like to look at the school year and go, okay, well, during the school holidays, we're going to use that as recovery. You know, it's kind of a deload and it's just going to be active fun time. And if you can fit in gym sessions, sweet, but let's not stress about that because it gets really hard when your kids are home all day and you're trying to figure out what to do with them. Plus you're trying to work and all those kinds of things. So it's kind of like we're pre-planning these kind of times when you can just let yourself relax. Then when we look specifically like at winter, winter time, it's really hard to get up early because it's cold, it's dark. It's like, okay, so maybe we're going to take a lunch session and a lunch session that you have because you have to be in and out of the office and within an hour, right? So we don't have a lot of time. You might have 35 minutes that you can actually spend working out. So we want to maximize that time. So four times a week in that 35 minutes, it's going to be similar to someone who is just starting, but we're going to warm up with the mobilizations. And then we're going to do some primers for some heavy lifting. So maybe we're going to just focus on squat or knee forward motion, or maybe we're going to focus on posterior chain, but we have a plan and we're going to really work on maybe a six, six, four, four rep scheme. So we're really lifting heavy in good form. And we finish with some plyo moves. So jumping or if we're not really focused on bone density that day with a hard landing, then we're going to work on the explosive stuff. So this could be box jump type stuff, or it could be some ballistic training where you're doing uh, weighted jumps or hex bar jumps or something like that. So you're getting some plyo and explosiveness. And then a cool down, eat, done. So you're hitting all of the things that you need to that's going to give you the strength, the power, the bone, the mobility in a very short, sharp session. And then on the weekend, when you have more time, that's when you can do your soul food kind of zone two, or if you have a longer time and you want to go do a total body gym workout and you have the flexibility to do that with your kids and you do it. So there's ways that we're looking at, okay, what are we doing with the school year? If you have kids, what are we doing with the seasons and the way that light affects us? And when our temperature comes up the most to be able to maximize our focus, our resilience. When it's summer and you have early light and late light, then you can have more time to play in the day. It's like, okay, if you're a morning person, we know that women who exercise first thing in the morning end up um, stimulating more 
abdominal adiposity loss. If they do more stuff in the evening, they end up with more strength gains. So there's a sex difference in that where it doesn't affect men. But for women, we see early morning is more about your body composition fat loss. And in the evening is more about strength gain. So then you have to figure out what's your goal. And we can work on timing if we have the opportunity. Otherwise, let's get it done first thing in the morning because then it opens up the rest of the day. And then you can, might have an ability for a longer session and maybe you're periodizing where you're like, I really want to build my overall strength and power. So we have a, a six week block just focusing on strength and power. Then we can move into adding some more intensity work when we're having a deload from the strength and power. So it's really up to the individual and we have to see what their, their plan is from a whole high point drone look for school and work. And then we can fit in according to the seasons, the motivation, and what their goals are. But I think one of the things that I, <clears throat> it's really important that you made there to clear up is people who are going to classes, because you've talked about this before, right, where the entire class is based around that combination of lifting with cardio, and they're splitting between lower body and upper body often aren't having enough resistance. Because I think the really important thing that I want people to take away from what you just said there was even though you were doing the plyometrics at the end, they were at the end and they were not part of the strength set exactly low repetition and heavy load so they actually were doing like a deadlift or something and really focusing on it and lifting that load and then they moved which could be body weight so not necessarily even any exogenous weight to jumping or doing something right which was doing more of that power and that bone density Exactly. The only time we would look at like mixing a heavy load with some cardio is if you're doing what we call contrast training or French contrast training, where you're doing a really specific heavy load lift right into a plyo type move back into a lift and then into uh, another plyo move. So you're maximizing both ends of the spectrum of how your muscle contracts. And that plyo move in the middle is to complement. So it could be a heavy bench pl- press right into uh, a med ball, um, a lying med ball toss that you're catching. It's a plyo move. So you're s- still getting the weight, but you're changing the action of the muscle. That's the only time you would put cardio into a lifting session, unless it's at the end. Unless it's at the end. And when would someone do that in the middle? So this is. Yeah. So this is part of the periodization. It's like, okay, if we want to build up our base, we can probably do that over winter. And then we want to um, look because when we are getting into more daylight, we are more stress resilient. Our immune system is higher. We tend to have more energy anyway, just the way that human bodies change with circadian and seasonality shifts. So this is where you put some more of that high intensity stuff in. And the contrast training usually is a four to six week block that comes after a big base of heavy lifting, because you have to be able to move well under heavy load before you can add that plyo part in. 